Um, essentially, to start with, welcome. My name's Loz, so I'm a tutor from Tute Smart, and today we'll be covering our Head Start lecture for Psych 3-4. So to kind of begin with, we will be going, it's about two and a half hours, we'll split it up generally into two content blocks, and you'll get a bit of a break in between. I'll talk about what we're going to cover in a second, but in general, you guys may have done a couple of ATAR notes lectures before. Again, I'm assuming most of you are in year 12. Some of you might be in year 11. I don't know any younger as well. Um, but yeah, you may be kind of familiar with the ATAR notes and the Tutes Mart website and stuff like that. Um, so essentially ATAR notes, it's kind of resources that are created by students for students as well. So it's people that have been, you know, like me in the same position as you not so long ago. Um, and kind of, yeah, sharing resources and insights and stuff like that. So we've been doing lectures for a while. Again, you guys may have done some of the lectures yesterday or the day before. Um, but yeah, essentially ATAR Notes kind of runs those lectures and we've got some other things that might be useful for you as well. So obviously, as I was just mentioning lectures, you may be familiar with the ATAR Notes forum. Um, that is kind of something where students tend to get a little bit of insight, again, and resources from other students. There's heaps of other things. So ATAR Calculator, that may be a little bit more relevant towards the end of the year videos on different topics, discussions, as I mentioned, study notes as well. Um, and bear in mind, you can head to the link down below for ATAR notes and all of these are free. Hopefully in January, you're not thinking about these too much, not getting too stressed already. But as the year goes by, you may find some of these resources really helpful. So go ahead and take a look at them if you like. As well, if you are interested in a little bit more to kind of help you out with this year, um, ATAR notes also has a couple of different resources so tute smart so that's kind of our tutoring program um where i tutor essentially so it's an online program and you are tutored basically by recent graduates who have obviously done the subjects that you guys are learning um and you can do that in group and one-on-one -on -one as well we've also got some study guides so they're kind of hard copy study guides um topic tests things like that if you know you're doing mainstream english a lot of english texts are kind of covered within those and then lastly and unlimited is basically those study guides but found online so it can be a bit more of an accessible platform with those i'll talk about them a little bit later but yeah those are just some things that ATAR notes tends to kind of do and if you're interested um you might want to look into more okay so before we kind of jump into the lecture and what we're going to cover a little bit about me so my name is loz I graduated in 2020, so I'm going into my third year of uni now, so I'm at Monash. Um, in psych, psych was probably my favourite subject, I would say. Um, I did it in year 11, so it was my first three, four. I did the one and two in year 10 as well, um, and I really enjoyed it. And I got a 50, and I also got a Premier's Award. Um, so yeah, hopefully today I can kind of share with you guys some of my tips and stuff like that, and how... You know, I kind of, I guess, came to enjoy psych as well as how I managed to do well in it too. So this is a little bit of an outline. Um, as you guys might be aware, especially if you've done one, two, psych three, four, there is quite a bit of content. Bear in mind, they have changed the study design this year. So you guys are the first cohort to essentially yeah, be examined with this study design. And there is, I would say, like a fair bit of information that's been removed. Um... I'm trying to think. I would say maybe there's like a little bit less content than the previous study design because like obviously they've put new stuff in. Um, I don't know. It just depends. In my opinion, I think it is a little bit less. I think that might be a good thing, but it is still relatively content heavy. Not a lot has changed. Um, but yeah, I'll talk about as we go through, I'll talk about parts that are I'll kind of highlight anything that's been added recently. And hopefully I'll try to mention as much as I can if anything's been removed. But obviously, if it's been removed, we won't really cover it this too much in this lecture. Um, so anyway, as you can see down the bottom, we're going to be splitting it basically into area of study one and area of study two. So we'll cover like nervous system and stress stuff and then going into learning and memory. Um, as I was mentioning, it's pretty content heavy. We will go through content pretty fast. For some slides, there is a decent amount of information in the screen and I won't talk through all of it. These slides will be available for you to download. There'll be a recording of the lecture as well. Um, at the end, I'll give out my email too, and you can always email me if you have any questions, if there's anything that I go through a little bit quickly that we don't answer in Q&A as well, that you can um, follow up or anything like that. So don't be worried. Like we will go through things fast, but hopefully you won't kind of miss anything and there'll always be opportunity to ask questions to catch up a little bit later. 
Um, so our first content block, as I mentioned, then we'll do a bit of Q&A at the end of that. And then we'll have about a 15 minute break and then it'll just be the same thing. We'll go through the second content block, have a bit of Q&A um, and then yeah, we'll finish up essentially. Um, I will try to allocate enough Q&A, especially at the time, I'm um, sorry, Q&A time, especially at the end. I find sometimes um, there can be more questions than I expect. So we'll have a look in the middle, but if anything, we might have to like speed up the end a little bit or cut the end a little bit short just so I can answer the questions because obviously I feel like answering the questions is of more value to you than kind of going through slides that you're going to get a copy of at the end if that sort of makes sense um yeah but hopefully that's okay and with Q&A I think I've seen a couple of questions already coming in you should be able to access that it's through Slido pop anything in you can upvote other people's questions as well um so yeah you can do that too Okay, so this is what we've got in Unit 3 and Unit 4. It's very, very similar to the old study design. Um, basically, the main difference I'll say in terms of the actual organisation is with Unit 4, last year there was a little bit more on consciousness. Um, so we are not covering Unit 4 today, but Unit 4 is kind of, there's a bit of stuff about sleep. And last year it used to be kind of sleep and consciousness. So just be aware of that, especially once you get into Unit 4 kind of a bit later in the year. That there's less of an emphasis on that so that's really important um i feel like i should flag this now for you guys um especially when you're using older resources be really aware of what has been kind of cut out what's irrelevant um and also what's added in as well because otherwise it would be a waste of your time to kind of be going over stuff that's been cut out and not going over stuff that's been added in if you're using older resources hopefully that kind of makes sense um, okay, yes, as I was mentioning with Slido, you can upvote stuff. It's anonymous. Um, yeah, essentially. I think most of you have kind of gotten that. And we'll do a couple of Slido polls as well throughout the lecture. So you can kind of, um, yeah, be quizzed a little bit. Okay, so we'll start one off to make sure everyone's kind of on it with Slido. Um, so we'll start off with what you guys are most concerned about going into psych this year. So hopefully this... Work. So it's, um, you can like write whatever you want to. So yeah, what you guys are most worried about in terms of psych, um, and hopefully I know it's January, like hopefully you guys aren't feeling too anxious or too worried, but what your kind of main concerns are, if any, maybe you don't have any, um, but yeah, in terms of results, in terms of your exam, in terms of study approaches, what is the one thing about psych that you're a little bit anxious for? And I'll do my best to kind of address this throughout the lecture as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, content. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. I feel like psych is pretty notorious. I don't know if that's the nice word to use, but yeah, um, for having, oh, like being really content heavy. Yeah, I'll let you, let me check the time. Yeah. I will let you guys type for a little bit longer as I work through them. Sorry if I missed them. Um, yeah, remembering everything. So basically, it's just a lot of content and memorization. Um, yeah, so some of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander content. So yeah, that's all new with this study design. Um, yeah, so kind of that new content coming in. Um, and I guess the thing with when study designs come in, the um, kind of worry, I guess, can be about having enough resources and having enough content um oh I guess resources that cover the new content so that's definitely um understandable but yeah there are a lot of resources obviously your teachers will have resources as well um and remember that everyone's in the same boat it's not like half of the grade has um you know heaps of other resources covering the new stuff in the study design like everyone everyone in the year is getting the new study design um they haven't been you know studying it in the past so I know it is like, it is tough. I'm not going to lie to be the first cohort to go through a new study design. Um, but yeah, everyone, again, everyone's in the same boat. Um, yeah, memorizing definitions. Yeah, short answer, content, content, content. First three, four subject. Yeah, yeah. So maybe some of you um, are in year 11. I didn't do one, two. Yeah. Um, with that, I will say don't be anxious about that. Um, I did the one two and I think it was 
nice because I obviously had like a baseline and then a bit of exposure to psych. And I think the main thing that I would have carried over is research methods. Um, so it's just basically like knowing all the terms of research methods. If you do other sciences and stuff like that, it's very similar. And like most of the stuff, like, you know, you know, in year 10, when you learn about scientific reports and stuff like that, like most of the stuff shouldn't be too foreign. When we talk about ethics and things, that may be a little bit new. Um, but yeah, that was, I feel like the main thing that I carried over and it's not too hard to kind of pick that stuff up. Um, in terms of other things, it's, it's fine really. Like, um, I know all of my friends at the school that I did, oh, I don't know, this is a bit of a long explanation. Basically I knew a lot of people that did psych, um, and they didn't do the one, two and they all did, I mean, like lots of people did well in it. Um, and they didn't like suffer from not doing the one, two. So don't really be too anxious oh yeah and don't feel like you're going to be behind compared to other people that have done the one two obviously like you do have some kind of level of confidence if you've done the one two but um yeah it's not don't worry about being behind there's nothing in three four that is vital that you've covered in one two that like you don't get taught again in detail and stuff like that um so yeah bear that in mind you don't have to be anxious about that yeah it's okay i'm seeing like a lot of content stuff so exam yeah it is January, don't feel too concerned about the exam yet. You've got a long way ahead of you. Um, yeah. 10 markers, yeah, yeah. 10 markers are very tricky in psych. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get through this a little bit quickly. Uh, research methods, yeah, research methods are really important. I will say this now in January, and I hope all of you remember this by the time your exam is in October or November do not neglect research methods while you're studying. It's so easy because psych is very content heavy and research methods, it's like the definitions, you know what I mean? And it's lots of application. And obviously you need to know the content before you're going to answer a research methods on the content, if research methods question. So like, obviously you need to know about sleep and the content and the theory of sleep before you answer questions about a sleep experiment, right? But don't neglect, you know, knowing your research methods, definitions, knowing your ethics, knowing, um, you know, the steps of like writing up a report and things like that. Um, cause I find, especially during exam time, everyone is very intent on studying the content, but they will be like, oh yeah, research methods. Like you just have to apply it to the content and they'll ignore it. Um, and then you really suffer in the exam and in your sex as well. Um, yeah. Okay. We'll try to address um, a lot of these throughout the lecture, but yeah, I see the main thing is content. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that hopefully towards the Q and A when we discuss like study tips and kind of breaking it up, um, and things like that. But yeah, all very valid things to be concerned about as well. Um, but yeah, nothing that you can't handle. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So here are some general tips. Um, definitions. I think I saw stuff in the Q, in the Q and A on the slide I pulled just then about definitions. Um, Compared to some of the other sciences, if you do the other sciences, there's less emphasis on knowing definitions. Um, like you can write your definitions and I definitely had like some definitions um, in my notes and stuff as well. So I'm not saying like never memorize a definition, like definitions are fine. Um, but just understand that again, compared to some other subjects, you're not really going to be asked like what is da da da. It's more so processes and you'll see that as we go through this kind of stuff you'll often be asked to explain and to apply I say this to um my students when I tutor psych like um application is everything all of the questions if you look at a VCAR exam it's all this is the scenario you know apply the content that you know to this scenario and that's something that psych is very specific about as well you have to refer to the name when you're answering the short answer um you know you can have this whole kind of broad cover of content, like broad concept, you know, that's being addressed in the question, but it may just be a specific part of that. And that's all you need to refer to. It's this idea of application. Um, so that's the most important part. So actually understanding concepts, understanding processes, that's something that you should prioritize a little bit more than, you know, I'm going to memorize all the definitions of these and then go into the exam. If you don't understand how the definitions or the processes tie in together, then there's no point if that's what makes sense. So in saying that, practice questions are really, really, really helpful. 
Um, with psych, there's a lot of multiple choice questions. Again, a lot of them are application. So practice questions are really helpful and you just get a lot of exposure um, to different scenarios essentially. So that's really, really important. Creating your own resources as well. This can be helpful, especially for memorization. I know some of the things that we addressed before were about um, issues with memorizing content and like being worried about memorizing content. Part of that is essentially memorization or understanding and creating your own resources. Obviously it's a little bit more effort, but that can kind of drill stuff in your head a little bit better. Um, so obviously you have like handwriting your notes, you have even making your own practice questions. If you've got a couple of friends in your class, collaborate with them, you know, you can create practice hacks and stuff like that and share them around. Again, I know it sounds like a lot of effort, um, but you can just write like four questions, swap them with your friend and then, you know, you've got eight questions there. And if you do that with multiple people, then you can get some more as well. And it just requires a very deep level of thinking if you're creating your own questions. If you're creating a question to quiz your friend on, you need to have very kind of thorough and deep understanding of what you're going to ask them about. And that's helpful as well, of course. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Again, as I go through this, remember that we'll be doing Q&A at the end. So I won't be answering questions like while we go through the content. So anything that comes up, if you've got any obviously general questions, if I go through something a little bit quickly and you just want to clarify it, pop it in the q and I'll do my best to get to it at the end of the content block. Um, as you'll see, when we go through our slides, they have um, the little kind of study design dot point that matches what we're going to talk about. I think this is a good way of reminding you guys that summarizing your notes based on the study design is really helpful. This is something that I learned from doing psych and I applied it in year 12, remembering that I did psych in year 11. Um, and I wish I did it like at the start of psych 3-4. Um, basing things around the study design, especially because you guys have a new study design as well, just makes it like makes you certain that you're addressing what you need to address. I remember when I was writing a psych chapter summary, it was something, I think something that's been taken off the study design. It was like leading questions or something like that. I don't know. And there was a case study in our textbook and I copied the entire case study into my notes and it was like so many paragraphs and it was just a case study. Um, and I remember after writing, it, I thought like that's, it was the biggest waste of time. Like it wasn't a specific case study that was referred to in study design or anything. And so stuff like that, you need to know when you're writing something that is irrelevant or unnecessary and that won't really help you with your learning that much. Um, and when you should be writing things down, but I'm vital that you're going to be assessed on. So therefore, if you have like something like, like you can literally write the study design dot point like this at the top of your page and then write your notes on that topic from there. And that can just help like you're always referring to it. Like you'll know you know, you're going to refer to the central and peripheral nervous systems. You know, you're going to be talking about conscious, unconscious responses, stuff like that. Um, so that is personally what I'd recommend. I would also know um, for the 10 marker, and this is something that you'll probably focus on only a little bit later in the year, um, but knowing the study design really well can help you a lot with your 10 marker. So that's what I would encourage as well. Okay, so essentially we have... Um, Lots of this is emphasis on the nervous system and basically with the nervous system, just understand communication. Like just think that the whole purpose is communication. We're talking about um, sending messages from different parts of the body to the other and kind of allowing the body to interact with the environment. That's basically what it is summed up. So receiving information, processing this information and then initiating a response in response to that information. So just think something coming in, figuring out what to do, our body, something goes out, we act in accordance kind of with the environment. Um, in terms of our branches, we've got the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And you can see outlined in the study design, it, oh my gosh, study design are the roles of the different subdivisions. So you'll need to know kind of this following diagram that we have here in terms of how they're broken up. So we have the peripheral nervous system. With psych, things are named very nicely so that you can remember them based on like their actions and stuff like that based on their names. So peripheral nervous system, peripheral, the periphery, the outside of the body, central nervous system in the center. The central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. So your brain, your spinal cord, like just think literally the center of your body. Peripheral nervous system, everything on the periphery. So basically your limbs, everything else. 
Um, in terms of the peripheral nerve system, that splits into our autonomic and our somatic. And then the autonomic splits into your sympathetic and parasympathetic. You need to know this really well, um, especially understanding sympathetic and parasympathetic comes from the autonomic. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to stress as well. But really, really understand this diagram. With psych, um, draw your diagrams, draw your flow charts, draw your mind maps, everything like that to get the content in. Like you can see, this is so much content as we'll talk about. Um, and if you can summarize it, visually in diagrams like this and just remember that sort of stuff that can help. Um, okay. So we'll look at the central nervous system first. So basically the peripheral nervous system is on the periphery. So that's what kind of interacts directly with the environment. And that will send a message to the central nervous system, central nervous system, obviously think about the brain, everything the brain does, and then it'll send that back out to the peripheral nervous system. Um, so basically the brain we're thinking about, processing and coordinating a response, the spinal cord, basically like a highway of neurons, um, which are those cells essentially in the nervous system that send those messages along. So we can see here it's, um, if the brain does everything in terms of processing that response and deciding what to do, the spinal cord allows that message coming from the brain to go back to the peripheral nervous system. And obviously initially the message that was coming from the peripheral nervous system to go up to the brain. Um, so think about that as well. Also something to be aware of is sensory information comes towards the brain. Motor information will come out. So we think of an acronym. Um, you'll hear this a lot. It's same. So sensory afferent. So afferent means to come kind of inwards and then motor efferent. So motor messages, motor information efferent. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but just be aware of that sensory and think like sensory, like sensation, you're picking up something. It makes sense that that's receiving information, um, and then motor coming out. Okay. The peripheral nervous system, um, again, basically everything outside of the brain and the spinal cord, and there's our sensory and motor stuff there as well. So somatic think soma, the body, this is when we think of, especially like our voluntary movement, our skeletal movement. Um, we're thinking of detecting things like um, temperature and stuff like that, like, you know, detecting stuff like your skin, detecting sensory things. Um, you know, as I'm sitting on the chair right now, the somatic nervous system kind of detecting that I'm sitting on the chair when I'm applying pressure to my hand, detecting stuff like that. Um, so the main thing that we think about is this idea of skeletal movement. So like voluntary, voluntarily moving my arm, things like that. Um, that is the main thing and that's what you'll associate it mainly with, but just be aware that we're still thinking about sensory information as well. Um, so you can see here afferent and efferent. So sensory is the same as afferent. Motor is the same as efferent. So that acronym is same, S-A-M-E. And you can see that's an example of an acronym. Um, if you can make your own up or you can become aware of other acronyms and memory aids like that, it can really help you kind of summarize content. Okay. And then lastly, autonomic, when you see autonomic, think of automatic, it's basically all these things that you don't necessarily think about. So you're thinking about your organs, your glands. Um, so you don't, you know, tell your stomach to start digesting food. You don't tell your glands to start releasing hormones voluntarily. The autonomic nervous system just does that. Um, so you can see that they're self-regulating. Okay, so then the autonomic nervous system splits into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So sympathetic, basically think, um, again, we'll talk about this when it comes to stress, but you're thinking about um, activating the body. So we're thinking about supplying energy to the muscles and enabling us to um, like survive. It's like a survival kind of mechanism. So just think about really kind of getting the body like wired up. Um, so we can see increasing the activity. It can be triggered by a stressor or a fear stimulus. So that's when we'll go into stuff with stress. Um, and you're thinking about, you know, hormones such as adrenaline, like, you know, think about where you've heard adrenaline before. Um, it's when you're thinking about, you know, when you're stressed or when you're excited for something and you're getting really worked up basically. Um, so you can see that physically as well. So your heart will start beating faster. Your breathing rate will increase There's other ones. Um, other changes as well. The opposite of that is the parasympathetic. So this is when we're thinking about calming down. Um, so you can think like 
um, stimulates sympathetic, peace, parasympathetic. My teacher used to tell me, and it stuck with me, I think I, I like it. Um, it's like parasympathetic, think of parachute, like when you're falling and then you pull your parachute and then it just drifts down kind of calmly. So that's when you can think about parasympathetic, like kind of calming the body down, slowing everything down. Um, so this is what is basically dominating most of the time. So obviously, hopefully when you're sitting watching this, when you're in class, most of the time, your heart rate isn't going crazy. Your breathing rate isn't going crazy. Your parasympathetic nervous system is dominating most of the time and you're relatively calm. Um, I want you to think of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic as like a seesaw maybe rather than a light switch. So it's not that the sympathetic nervous system turns on and off and the parasympathetic turns on and off. They're kind of constantly, yeah, like think of a seesaw. Like if you're running away from a lion, your sympathetic nervous system goes heavy on the seesaw and the parasympathetic nervous system, you know, is just put away for a little bit. It's not this kind of on and on on and off response. It's just that they're kind of always one's dominating the other, basically. So this is a table that you should um, essentially remember. I'm not going to go through it. Um, but basically think about when you get anxious, think about when you get nervous and all this stuff that happens. So lungs, obviously breathing rate increasing, pupils dilating, um, your digestive system basically shutting down because it's a little bit irrelevant. You don't need to be digesting your lunch if you're running away from a lion, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So look at that again in your own time, but ultimately you will need to remember these kind of things because they have come up in multiple choice questions before. Okay, so in terms of a conscious versus an unconscious response, it's really what it sounds like. Um, so a conscious response, we basically think of being conscious, being aware of it. It's a voluntary response. Um, so often we think about, again, voluntarily moving a muscle, things like that. Um, so the example there, kind of being aware, you're putting on sunglasses because the sun's shining. That idea of interacting with your environment, you've detected that the sun is shining brightly your brain is thinking, hmm, what should I do? I'll put sunglasses on. An unconscious response, however, obviously unconscious. So it doesn't require that um, awareness. You're not consciously making this decision or initiating this response. Your body is doing it um, without your awareness, essentially. So we're thinking blinking, heart beating. Again, lots of autonomic stuff or stuff with organs, you might think. Um, so a spinal reflex, we're thinking of an unconscious response because you don't willingly or voluntarily initiate a reflex. Um, so this often again is talked about in the context of survival and things like that. Like when you're touching a hot pan, um, when you're maybe like pricked by a needle, stuff like that. Um, as you can see with the example, you're touching something hot, you pull your hand away, you don't touch it you know, the message doesn't get sent to your brain and you're thinking, mm, what should I do while your hand is set on fire? You do it instantly. Um, so that's your spinal reflex. And that is something that you have to be aware about. So again, I'll talk through this generally. Um, look back on the diagrams if you have to. So basically we have our sensory information coming in. We're touching something hot. This goes into our spinal cord. It does not go to our brain. This is a really important thing with the spinal reflex, I think. Ooh. Um, yeah, without any involvement of the brain. Super important to be aware of that. So um, your finger detects the heat. It goes to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, there may be an interneuron. Um, so an interneuron, basically its role is, as it suggests, interneuron. It just sends a message from one neuron to another. So your sensory neuron detects that heat sends it to the spinal cord you've got an interneuron that relays that message and then your motor neuron will move the arm so it makes sense sensory detecting the sensation of heat motor movement of that arm um, and so you can see that is done extremely quickly we're thinking detection send it to the spinal cord send it right back out to the arm and move it so that's your spinal reflex and you can see at no point does it go to the brain and does the brain say, okay, yeah, but yeah, good idea. Like let's move our hand away from the heat. Um, again, cause it's this idea of kind of this survival mechanism. It limits the amount of damage caused to your hand. Um, and you can see that with other certain reflexes as well. However, the spinal reflex does not involve the brain in this little reflex arc. 
the message is sent to the brain later on. So that's why when you touch something hot and you move your hand away instantly, you'll detect pain after your hand is away because that message is being relayed to the brain. It's more like, it's like an FYI um, saying like, hey, you know, we've just done this. And so then that's when you detect that pain, but that's after the fact. Um, so just be aware of that. That's really important. Okay, so in terms of neurons, I want you to pay attention to this point on the study design. Um, it's the role of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are what are released by neurons and they essentially enable the neurons. So remember, these are the cells in your nervous system to communicate with one another. In the old study design, there used to be stuff where you had to actually like know, um, like it outlines the parts of a neuron. That isn't listed anymore. However, I've still kept these in these slides because I think it just can help for a little bit of completion um but I do want to emphasize that on the side of design there's no longer that dot point explicitly saying um you know know the body parts not the body parts the specific parts of a neuron the specific roles of the different parts and things like that um but again I think it is a good idea just to have a bit of awareness because if you're going to talk about neurotransmitters I feel like it does make a little or it helps to kind of add that context of what a neuron looks like. Um, so in general, we're thinking of basically it's just a nerve cell um, and it's whole thing. Remember how I talked about the nervous system, the whole thing being communication essentially. Um, so the neuron is the individual cell that enables that. So again, communication is the huge role here. Um, so this is what it looks like. Essentially the message comes from this side of the neuron to the next. And just think of like a billion of these in a row, you're just getting, you know, from the dendrites to the axon terminal. So in this diagram, it's left to right. You're just thinking left to right. So dendrites through the axon terminals of one neuron, the next neuron, dendrites, axon terminals, dendrites, axon terminals. And that's how the message passes, you know, from the neurons in your um, finger to the neurons in your spinal cord to the neurons in your brain. So just understand that I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail. Um, but understand that dendrites are just receiving that message. It's just being passed through the axon and then through the axon terminal. And so the axon terminal of this neuron is going to communicate with the dendrites of the next neuron. Remember how, what I talked about? Dendrites, axon terminals, dendrites, axon terminals. And that's where our neurotransmitters come in. Um, so maybe I'll talk about axon terminals a little bit. So we can see basically that at the end, um, the definitions can be a little bit interchangeable. I'm not going to like axon collaterals. You don't really talk about stuff like that. So you have your axon terminals. They're just, as it suggests, the terminal end, you know, like the end of the axon. And then they have this little bit on the end called a terminal button. And that's where your neurotransmitters sit, basically waiting to be released, waiting to transmit a message. Um, and that's essentially what allows the message that is currently passing through this neuron to exit within these neurotransmitters to then be conveyed to the next neuron. So you can see that here. Um, so these are the neurotransmitters waiting at the end of this terminal button. They're just kept in these little sacs and they will cross this important little gap that we call the synapse. It is tiny, but it's that little gap between one neuron and the next. So this would be the um, axon terminal of the what we call the presynaptic neuron. So the synapse, presynaptic, before the synapse, you've got the end of one neuron. And then you have the dendrites where the receptors are from the postsynaptic neuron, so after the neuron. So you can see that here, postsynaptic, so after the synapse, presynaptic. So it makes sense. The presynaptic neuron is sending a message to the postsynaptic neuron. Hopefully this is making sense. Um, so this kind of crosses here. We've got our neurotransmitters and they will bind to receptors again on the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. They'll initiate a response. That dendron, sorry, that neuron, so the postsynaptic neuron, now that message is being passed through, again, it's the same thing from the dendrites to the postsynaptic neuron's axon terminals. And then the same thing will happen. It'll send neurotransmitters to the next neuron and then the next neuron and the next neuron and the next neuron. So that is a very brief overview. Hopefully that makes sense. The part that is emphasized in the study design dot point is the actual role of the neurotransmitters themselves. 
So be aware they are a chemical substance. So they're a little chemical molecule. Um, in like neurons, when they're passed through the axon, you'll see a lot of this stuff like action potentials, electrical impulses in your textbooks and stuff like that. So when a message goes through a neuron, it's electrical. When it comes like out of the neuron, so with the neurotransmitters, it's chemical. So understand that. The neurotransmitter is a little chemical molecule. Um, so we can see here it binds to the receptor sites, what we've just talked about, of the postsynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron releases the neurotransmitters. So just think, again, the names are very helpful. Presynaptic, postsynaptic, you've got your synapse in the middle, your neurotransmitters will head across. Um, okay, so this idea of having an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. So basically with this diagram here, these neurotransmitters will bind and then they'll initiate a response in the postsynaptic neuron. And that can be either excitatory. So that will tell this neuron, you know, fire, like send this electrical impulse, send this message to the other neuron, to this neuron, to that neuron, like fire, 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 like keep sending messages. Or it can be inhibitory. Um, so it's saying stop firing, don't send as many messages as you were sending before, or stop sending messages, stuff like that. Um, so neurotransmitters that you have to be aware of, glutamate is really important. This will come up in learning as well. So glutamate is excitatory. So remember this, excitatory neurotransmitter. So we're thinking about stimulating the presynaptic neurons. It's telling them fire, fire, fire. And think about that. Therefore, it does make sense that it would be important in learning because when you're learning something, you're building more neural pathways, you're connecting neurons together it makes sense that glutamate is involved because you would want those neurons to be firing together stronger. So we're thinking excitatory. On the other hand, we have GABA. Um, so this is our inhibitory neurotransmitter. So basically just the opposite. Um, so this is when we want to calm down our neurons. Basically, if we've got neurons firing a little bit too much, GABA will be sent and it'll tell them calm down a little bit. Um, good way to remember this, glutamate equals go, GABA equals slow. Again, just a little like jingle, I guess you could call this. If you can make your own for other parts of the study design, again, really, really helpful memory aids. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. Again, this is more of an FYI because the lock and key process was outlined on the previous study design. Like it was written, you have to know the lock and key process. Um, that isn't there anymore. So again, this is just for completion, I would say. Um, but yeah, there's a bit of a less of an emphasis. Essentially, it's just this idea of what I've shown you before of the synapse of the neurotransmitter binding to the receptor on the dendrite. It's like a lock and key. So you have to have the right neurotransmitter in the right receptor. It's not a one size fits all. So the receptor that accepts glutamate will not accept GABA, will not accept any other neurotransmitter. There's specific. It's like a lock in a key. So that's my kind of main thing there. Um, okay, this is new with this study design. So neuromodulators. Um, so we're talking about dopamine and serotonin. Basically, the difference with our neurotransmitters and our neuromodulators is that they can have sort of both um, effects. They can modulate, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so we can see here excitatory and inhibitory effects um, and kind of it's a little bit more complex than just the excitatory and inhibitory. So like, um, you know, fire, fire, fire or don't fire. They can modulate things a little bit more. So we have dopamine. Um, again, you may have you may be familiar with these two, essentially. Um, but we're thinking about there's quite a few roles for dopamine. So balance and movement. So we're thinking about actually like physical stuff and particularly things to do with the cerebellum um, and different areas of the brain, but also pleasure and rewarding behaviors. So often you'll hear about, um, you know, like in addiction and things like that, like dopamine um, can be a reason why, you know, you want to, you can get addicted and stuff like that because this idea of it being involved in like the reward system of the brain. Um, so it can be both excitatory and inhibitory. And something else with neuromodulators, this idea of it being released from a neuron far from its receptor site. Um, so with our neurotransmitters, we're thinking about the synapse. It's tiny, right? So we're just crossing from one neuron to the next, very, very close to each other. 
Whereas with dopamine and some other neuromodulators, they can be really far away from their target cell. And we see that with serotonin as well. I'll explain this in a second, but it also acts as a hormone. So hormones travel in the bloodstream. And so therefore they can go really distant areas. So compared to our neurotransmitters, which go from one neuron to the other and the synapse is tiny, our neuromodulators or our neurohormones, they can go from a neuron pretty far away from the next neuron or the next cell, the next organ, whatever it's targeting, they can be quite a distance. Um, also this idea of influencing effects of other chemical messengers. So that's again, that kind of modulation part of it. So dopamine, yeah, think about pleasure, rewarding behaviors, movement as well. Um, serotonin, we think about particularly with sleep and mood. Um, it's called like the happy hormone. So think about that. Um, again, levels of that in the brain can determine, you know, how happy one feels, how sad one feels, stuff like that as well. Okay, synaptic plasticity. Um, so we're looking at long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So again, these are processes. See how it's processes more so than certain definition y stuff. Um, this is new for the study design, sprouting, rerooting, and pruning. Those come up in one, two. They may have come up in like the previous, previous study design. Um, but yeah, basically there will be a lot of resources with sprouting, rerooting, and pruning. So don't really be too worried about that. Um, and you can see we're already kind of introducing this concept of memory formation and learning as well. So understand, you can see how I'm talking about the nervous system as part of area study one, and we're already linking to stuff in area of study two. You see that all over psych, um, everything is linked. Everything is like the concepts all kind of share similar stuff. So again, mind maps can be really, really good, especially when you get to the end of the year and you're trying to remember all of unit three and all of unit four as well. Um, okay, so neural plasticity, basically it's this idea of plasticity being able to change. It's not being rigid. It's not that a neuron is stuck in the form that it's always in. And that's therefore how we can learn new things, how we can forget things, um, how we can remember things as well. So neural plasticity we have here, how the brain's neurons are able to be changed in terms of their actual structure, in terms of their function as well as you learn new things, as you experience things, as you age as well. Um, yeah, so essentially neuroplasticity and synaptic plasticity, they're used pretty interchangeably, I would say. Just like think about the words, neuroplasticity, neuron, synaptic plasticity, specifically the synapse, relatively interchangeable. Okay, so we've got our sprouting, rerouting, and our pruning. Think of the words again. So sprouting, like a shrub, like a little tree sprouting, um, we're getting our new neural connection. So we're thinking of new pathways. Rerouting is basically this idea of um, the neural pathway once went this way, now it's going that way. We're just changing the route. And again, this may be due to damaged neurons in particular. Basically, you've just got the same synaptic pathway, but it's just taking a different direction. Pruning, think about you know pruning your hedges and stuff like that. It's getting rid of stuff that we no longer want to be there. Um, so if this synaptic pathway isn't being used very often, if we're not using these neurons a lot, if they're useless, um, we'll get rid of them because the brain is always, especially with learning and memory, we're always just wanting to be really efficient. Think about, you know, glutamate, you're wanting to excite the next neurons so that every time you recall something, it comes quicker, it comes faster. And that's why, you know, when you learn ultimately like this stuff, it may be all very new to you in January. By the time it's October, by the time you're in your exam in November, you'll be able to recall this stuff really quickly. Um, so that's the whole thing with learning. The first time you're quizzed on something, it may take a while. The neurons trying to sort themselves out after you constantly, constantly, constantly revisit that pathway when you're revising, when you're doing your practice questions, when you're being taught stuff in class, these neural pathways are getting more and more efficient and then it's getting easier for you to recall the information. So that's why this stuff is really important. And the whole thing is just to create that sort of efficiency in the brain and to get rid of things that aren't serving a purpose anymore. Okay, with long-term potentiation and depression, these are basically opposite processes. So potentiation, we're strengthening synaptic connections, depression, we're weakening them basically. So long-term potentiation, again, very involved in learning. Um, 
basically it's this idea that we can see um, the main part is this third sentence so the postsynaptic neuron becomes more and more responsive to the presynaptic neuron it's like they're a little pair basically so the postsynaptic neuron is thinking this neuron is always sending me messages it's always um you know telling me to do this I'm going to strengthen my relationship with them. The connection is going to become stronger. So that's like when, you know, you're learning a language and you're revisiting the same words, the same topic. You're constantly revisiting this. Again, the brain is thinking, hmm, this neural pathway is always being activated. Let's make it stronger. So the person up to neuron will just become more receptive. You might get more receptors. You might get, you might get more neurotransmitters being sent. Basically, that connection is becoming stronger. And the time it takes to kind of get the message through won't be as long. So it's more efficient. On the other hand, we've got long-term depression. So this is when the brain realizes this neural pathway is never being used. These two neurons, they don't talk to each other that much anymore. Um, let's break them apart. So we're getting a decreased strength. So we're getting less firing. Um, and it's this idea caused by lack of stimulation. So the postsynaptic neuron things like just think of them getting more distant basically so we've got maybe less receptors we've got maybe less neurotransmitters being released because the brain realizes i don't need to put my resources into this neural pathway anymore because it's not being used so hopefully that makes sense this is just a bit of a visual display so you can see long term long term potentiation more neurotransmitters sent think more receptors things are just tying together a lot nicely and again, this is because we're getting repeated activation of this pathway, the opposite for long-term depression. We're getting less neurotransmitters, less receptors because of less stimulation of that pathway. Okay, I know that was a lot of information. Again, refer to the slides later if you have to, um, but just understand the stuff basically for now. We'll go to a slider poll. The polls are not too tricky, I hope. Um, so GABA is an excitatory or inhibitory neurotransmitter that increases or decreases LTP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, looks pretty good. Okay. Um, okay, I'll lock this one now. So yeah, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and so therefore it would decrease LTP. If we're thinking of long-term potentiation, we're thinking of strengthening, stuff associated with learning, we're thinking of exciting those neurotransmitters. That's not sorry, exciting those neurons. That's not going to be an inhibitory neurotransmitter that does that. Um, so yeah, remember that GABA is our inhibitory. The opposite is glutamate. So glutamate is our excitatory neurotransmitter that would increase LTP. Um, let me have a look at this poll. I can't even remember the questions that I... Okay, yeah, this is another one too. Um, so which one of the following best identifies the type of response provided by a spinal reflex? So the reflex arc that we looked at before with that diagram. Which one identifies the type of response? Yep, looking good. Yep, okay. I feel like I'll look at that. I feel like I'm missing this one. Um, involuntary, essentially. So thinking of unconscious involuntary um, versus the other ones, voluntary and controlled. That is not what you'd call a spinal reflex. Conditioned, we'll learn about classically conditioning a bit later on. But that's to do with learning and stuff like that. So yeah, involuntary. Okay. Um times okay so next we're moving on to stress so that was it for nervous system again any questions you have pop them in the q a so with stress we've got our internal and our external stresses that cause psychological and physiological so basically the brain and the body um we're thinking about flight fight or freeze and roll of cortisol most of this is really the same as last year um 
in terms of definitions, I know I said definitions, not really important. I probably remember the definition for stress. Um, so basically we're thinking of physiological and psychological arousal. So stress is a mental process and a physical process. Um, stresses cause stress and they happen when the individual kind of perceives the stimuli to be challenging or that they don't have the ability to cope. So understand that it is that kind of two people can be exposed to the same, the same stressor. One person may get seriously stressed out. The other, they may be fine because the idea of what causes stress is this idea that the this individual perception. So you have to think this has reason to cause me stress or I don't have the physical or I don't know, any capability to overcome this challenge. And then you're going to feel stressed out versus the exact same thing may happen to someone else. They may think like, I can deal with this in my sleep. It's fine. Um, okay. I'm pretty straightforward. So, um, understand stress can be good or bad, especially when we think about physiological arousal, it's not necessarily, um, a bad thing. Like we'll talk about fight, flight, freeze. And we talked about it a little bit before when we looked at the sympathetic nervous system, remember that kind of list we're thinking of your heart beating, your breathing rate increasing, pupils dilating, stuff like that. Um, that stuff doesn't necessarily happen only in bad times. Like, you know, when you are getting ready for like a sports competition or something, maybe you'll think about that. And it's not necessarily that you're, I mean, you might be anxious that something will go wrong. Um, but maybe, you know, you're just excited sometimes before you go on a roller coaster ride, before you go to like an event, right? Like you're not going to think like when you're going to this event that something like a major catastrophe is going to happen, but you still feel this experience. So it's not that stress is only a bad thing. Um, so we have acute stress and chronic. So acute basically just means um, like for a short period of time, chronic over a long period of time. So acute, um, it might be something like, you know, your upcoming sack or your exam. Once the exam is over, that stress will probably go away. Whereas chronic, um, it basically lasts for, could be months and months. Um, and obviously chronic stress can be really harmful. Um, acute stress, obviously it does depend like when it becomes harmful, but in general, obviously it's quite normal to feel stressed for a test, um, or for an exam, but chronic stress, that's when sometimes it can be really damaging to one's health. Okay. So fight, flight, freeze again, sorry, I'm going to go back to the study design, study design dot point associate fight, flight, freeze with acute stress and cortisol with chronic stress. So fight, flight, freeze, like, you know, you've probably heard of this before. Um, like when we're fighting the lion, like our survival response, it's very brief. Um, so physical response in particular, so we're going to fight something, flight, we're going to freeze. So fight and flight often you'll probably hear like colloquially or in other media and stuff like that. You'll hear it as the fight flight response. You might not hear it as the freeze response. This is kind of a psychology thing and there's less known about the freeze response. I would say it is a little bit different to the other two. So fight and flight, again, sympathetic nervous system. Um, so all the typical things we see with the sympathetic nervous system, as you can see with heart rate, breathing rate, etc. Um, there's a lot of stuff here. I know it's not too vital, but the hormones are. So everything in blue, like everything colored, that's what you really need to remember. Um, so adrenaline and noradrenaline, even noradrenaline, like it's mm, like adrenaline. Just think about that. Um, and that's when you get that sympathetic nervous system stuff. So you've got, um, all these bodily changes because this adrenaline is acting on your cells in your heart, it's acting on the cells in your lungs. It's acting on the cells in your liver. So think of like glucose release, you know, muscles, stuff like that. The whole thing, again, when you look at that table that we looked at a little bit, like a while ago, um, it'll make sense. Like the whole point will be you want to send um, glucose to the muscles or you want to send oxygen to the muscles. You want the blood to pump faster to get the stuff to the muscles. So you have the best chance of survival and, you know, fighting something or fleeing from something. Um, it's all about this kind of activation and getting the body as much energy as we can. Um, and yeah, the hypothalamus and stuff is involved. I'll let you look at that on your own. It's not the most vital thing I would say, but just understand adrenaline. Um, so that's it with fight, f fight and flight. So it's pretty straightforward. And the content of that is very interchangeable with anything with the sympathetic nervous system. So the stuff we touched on, on that sympathetic slide, when we looked at it in nervous system and the slide we've just been through very similar concepts.
Um, so with freeze, this is when it's a little bit different because instead of the sympathetic nervous system being really dominant, and obviously compared to when you're calm, when the parasympathetic nervous system is really dominant, you've almost got like a little bit of like the seesaw is a little bit equal in this freeze point. So you've got the sympathetic stuff going on because you are pretty stressed, but for some reason, the parasympathetic nervous system also kicks in. And so your body kind of freezes and you're in this sort of state of shock, um, as opposed to this kind of activation to fight or to run away. So you can see you'll get stuff here, like the heart rate dropping, blood pressure dropping, um, muscles losing the tension. So you're again, seeing this freeze response. Um, and it's just this idea of both of these systems being dominant. When we think about cortisol, basically, so say, you know, a lion's chasing you. Okay. You get to shelter. The lion's gone. The parasympathetic now grows dominant and you calm down. However, if this stressor is pretty long, so sometimes, you know, you might think about a sack or, um, your exam, maybe the whole concept of year 12, um, is really stressing you out and you're getting this kind of chronic stress. The stressor is not going away is the thing that I'm trying to get at. The body will realize like, hmm, okay, this little fight flight thing isn't good enough. I'm going to release some cortisol. So cortisol, basically the whole point of cortisol is it um, sort of like mobilizes glucose. Like if we're thinking about, again, this is a little bit technical, but um, with fight flight, you know, we're thinking about, we want to run away, stuff like that. So what cortisol will do is enable the body to have sort of this glucose released and stuff like that. That's what it does at sort of a scientific level. But generally what you guys just need to understand, it's, it just allows the body to kind of adapt to this stress and kind of be a little bit more um, prepared to face the stress, to deal with the stress really. So cortisol kicks in and the body gets a little bit like stronger to the stressor um, or allows you to kind of go at it for a little bit longer. Um, However, cortisol can become, I don't know, yeah, cortisol can become bad when you have it for a long time because it weakens your immune system. Um, so ultimately, like the body kicks it in and you deal with that stressor for a bit. But if that stressor lasts for even longer and that stress is very chronic and you've got it for a long time, um, ultimately, that's when you do start to see the body kind of suffering. So that's when you see how chronic stress can really affect um one psychologically and physically because of this idea of it makes you very susceptible to you know at first it's like coughs and colds and then it can be more serious immune conditions as we'll look at in a second um but yeah so understand that after fight flight which is just the short remember we talked about acute stress if that stressor doesn't go away the body kicks in with this release of cortisol so it's also known as like the stress hormone um and so it tries to allow the body to cope with it for a bit longer ultimately because it has this like side effect of weakening the immune system sometimes the body gives out okay so looking at the gut brain axis this is a new thing as well be aware as an area of emerging research I'm not i'm not gonna lie like lots of things in psych are areas of emerging research like even when i did it um especially when you we were looking at like sleep and consciousness so some of the stuff in unit four like a lot of the stuff it's like we don't know what the purpose is or, you know, we're still researching it. Like it's, you're looking at new stuff, right? There's a lot, a lot, a lot of the brain that isn't known. Um, and so that's why with a lot of this stuff that you look at in psych, you look at theories um, because like there's a couple of theories and lots of them will be like very accepted. So you'll be like, okay, this theory is pretty accurate, but it's still a theory because there's not enough research to kind of say like, this is 100% the case. Um, yeah, so I feel like that's a good and a bad thing with psych. I don't know, it's just a thing. But like, as long as you know what the study design needs you to know, you'll be fine. Um, so you can see here with reference to the interaction of gut microbiota with stress and the nervous system in the control of psychological processes and behavior. So basically it's this idea of how, I guess the gut can play a role in stress essentially. So the gut to brain axis, just think about something linking your gut in your brain, really. So your stomach in your brain. Um, links this central nervous system with the enteric nervous system. I'm not going to go too much into the enteric nervous system, but basically, um, it's just to do with your stomach or like your gastrointestinal system, really. So microbiota, that's basically your, you would have heard of this, I'm sure. Like, um, it's just the healthy bacteria that live in your gut. 
like I'm sure you wear, you basically have bacteria everywhere. Like, you know, all on your skin, you've got like good bacteria um, everywhere, really, or most places. Um, so in the gut, it's really important for like gut health. You know, you would have seen like probiotics and all that. Um, so it's really important in a person's health, essentially. So it can have effects when stress happens and it also can have an effect on how one experiences stress. Um, so we can see again, an area of emerging research. So a healthy microbiota can influence this idea of the levels of certain hormones and neurotransmitters. So what we've talked about, you know, our GABA, our dopamine, our serotonin. So if our microbiota is a little bit out of whack, um, we can get levels of those kind of thrown a little bit out of control, or we can get certain processes such as inflammation. We can get the release of certain other hormones that can lead to anxiety. And obviously that has an effect on us psychologically and then again leading to stress as well. So it's all this idea of this interaction between your gut and your brain really and how it links with stress. So this is kind of the important stuff. Um, so the relationship is bi-directional, as I was kind of mentioning before. So your gut microbiota, that can have an effect on your brain, but your brain can also have an effect on your gut microbiota. So it's this kind of relationship between, um, I don't want to say like what you're eating. Like obviously it affects, you know, what you're eating can directly affect microbiota and stuff like that. But it's this idea of how your brain and your stomach, like the enteric nervous system and that are quite linked through this gut brain axis. So if there's a change, a major change to one, like if you have a really unhealthy microbiota, it's going to have an effect on your brain. If you've got, you know, something going on with the brain, it'll have an effect on the microbiota um, and kind of throw that out of whack. And then like sometimes you can think about how when you're stressed or you're nervous, you know, you might get an upset stomach or like butterflies in the stomach, stuff like that as well. So you can kind of think about that link. Um, so we can see here. The levels of neurotransmitters, which we've discussed, it affects neuroplasticity as well. Um, the amygdala we'll talk about with memory, but basically it's pretty important in memory. Um, and how your brain affects the gut microbiota. So the brain obviously coordinates the release of neurotransmitters and your hormones, and that can affect the gut. Um, and also stress hormones being released as well. So prolonged stress, chronic stress, as I talked about with cortisol, it has effects all over the body really. Um, but again, that link of the gut-brain axis can see those effects come directly through to the gut. Okay, looking at gas, so this is physiological. We'll look at another model that is psychological. So just think gas, physiological, really tie that in. Um, so you have three stages, alarm, resistance, exhaustion. So alarm is basically the initial kind of perception of the threat um, of the stressor. So you're first becoming aware of it. Um, you go into shock and counter shock. Basically, shock is when the body is like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And everything, I think, do we have a diagram? Yeah. So everything kind of dips and you're like, oh, I don't really know what to do in the body. You can see the normal level of resistance, it actually decreases. So the body is kind of less able to tackle this stress just from the initial shock. And then we have counter shock. So then the body's like, okay, we need to do something. Sympathetic nervous system kick in. We're going to release our adrenaline. We're going to fight this stressor. And you can see that's when our resistance starts to rise above normal. In the resistance stage, again, as the name suggests, we're resisting this stressor. So our resistance is really nice and high. Um, compared to normal, you know, we're fighting this stressor. We're trying to tackle it as best as we can. This is when cortisol comes in. I will flag some resources. Again, think about psych. Nothing is really known 100%. Some might say cortisol is released in alarm. Some might say resistance. I don't know. Just stick with what your teacher tells you. Obviously, VCAR knows this as well, that different resources say different things. So they're not going to be too picky about that. Um, for me, I always used to say it was released in resistance. And that's generally what most sources that I use said. Um, but yeah. So you've got that kind of chronic stress. The body's realizing like, oh, okay, this stressor is sticking around for a bit longer than I thought. Cortisol is going to be released. Um, and again, we have this effect of the immune system weakening. So this is when we're getting our initial kind of little coughs and our colds and our flus. So that's why you might see like during exam time, during SAC week and things like that, students might tend to get a little bit fluy, a little bit sick. Often it's because um, like obviously other factors involved, but that stress can make them a little bit more susceptible. So the last stage we have exhaustion. So this is when the body is still fighting this stressor. Um, and you can see 
finally, like the ability to deal with the stressor just sort of plummets. So you can see the body has been trying to tackle this stressor for a long time. Ultimately, it can't do it anymore. The body can't go on forever. Um, so this is when you can get really extreme fatigue. You've got a lot of anxiety. And then this is where your major illnesses start to come in. So you can get things like pneumonia um, or even heart disease. Like this is, we're thinking of really prolonged stress here. And the body has basically just reached its limit. Um, so yeah, again, physiological. This is a sort of one size fits all approach. This is what happens to everybody's, you know, physiological response um, when we're faced with a stressor. So in terms of these strengths, this idea of linking stress to the body, you know, it's not just a mental process. It can actually make you sick. Um, this idea of exhaustion. Limitations, there are a few. So again, this one size fits all. It doesn't really factor in that individuals are different, perceptions are different, stuff like that. Um, it basically overemphasizes the physiological aspect and doesn't discuss the psychological enough. And lastly, a big one, um, it was tested on rats. So it's kind of applying, like, they saw, like, this stuff all happened in rats. And then it's saying, okay, so the same thing must happen in humans. Um, but obviously, there might be a discrepancy there. Okay, um, so with Lazarus and Folkman's, this is basically the psychological model. So we're thinking about um, the transaction part of this basically comes from whether a person experiences stress or not. Um, is based on this interaction with one's environment. So it's very heavy on perception, on deciding things are stressful, weighing up your coping, stuff like that. So I know this looks a little bit, uh, but after a while you will get it. I'm not expecting you to get it today. We're going through it quickly. There's a lot of stuff. So don't be worried. Um, but basically we have these two steps. So your primary appraisal. So appraisal just means like to, to appraise something, to kind of um, judge it almost um and then your secondary appraisal primary first secondary second um so basically you're exposed to a stressor the primary appraisal is the main question you're asking is this stressful yes or no and if so what type of stress so you can go through some of these options if you decide that it is stressful you'll decide okay is it something in the past you know have i lost something have i been harmed as a result is it something that is stressing me out because in the future it's going to be a threat? Or this is like the, like, yay, like perseverance, like nice one. Am I perceiving it as a challenge? Am I thinking like, hmm, this is going to stress me out, but I'm going to tackle this challenge and I'm going to do my best and I think I can kind of overcome it. So generally that's how you see it. Ultimately the same, like the pathway is the same. You go to your secondary appraisal and the idea is, Okay, I've perceived that this is stressful. How am I going to deal with this? Um, so basically two options really. You either decide, okay, the coping resources are adequate. So for example, the stress is your upcoming sack. So this would be a threat because it's something in the future and the reason you're stressed about it is probably because you think you're gonna fail or whatever, I don't know. Um, so you then get to your secondary appraisal and you think, okay, no, like my teacher's really good. My tutor's really good. My friends are really good. I've got heaps of resources and I've got a lot of time over the next week. I'm going to study hard and I think I'll be able to get it. So my coping resources are adequate. So then therefore you might say like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to be that stressful. However, if your coping resources are inadequate, then you know, you think like my teacher sucks, like my resources are bad. I don't know anything about psych. The test is next week. I'm working every day. I like can't, I can't deal with the stressor. I don't have the ability to handle it. Then you're going to feel really stressed. Um, in saying that, there is this idea of reappraisal. So this is kind of a really good thing about the model that it factors in this idea that you can change your perception. So maybe you experience stress. Um, after all, maybe you might be thinking like, okay, you might reappraise the situation. Um, you might ask your teacher for help. I don't know, whatever you reappraise it. And then it's not as stressful, or you can reappraise it as even more stressful stuff like this. Basically the main thing is this idea that it's not, okay, I've chosen this option, this option, this option. That's the model. It's this idea that individuals are very different. We can perceive things as challenging. We can perceive things as stressful. And then 
our circumstances can change and it can be different. Okay, that's a very brief summary. Hopefully it kind of makes sense. Um, but that's kind of what I've been talking about here. So primary is just like, is it stressful? Secondary is, okay, now what am I going to do about it? Um, okay, so in terms of our strengths, again, really good on this idea of it being individual um, and this idea of why it's not one size fits all, why two people can have the exact same stressor. Two people can have the same sack next week. One person is like very stressed about it. One person is not. And why? Um, in terms of limitations, because it is this very, very psychological process, it is very hard to test this through an experiment. Like think about the model that I've just discussed and like try to draw up an experiment for it. It can be quite tricky. Sorry, tricky. Um, this idea of primary and secondary appraisals, there is this kind of idea of um, are they really that separate? Are they one thing? Are they even like done consciously? Stuff like that. Um, and this idea, especially as you can see, sorry to flick back and forth. Um, like if our coping resources are inadequate, we're going to experience stress. If they're adequate, we're not. So that's a bit of a thing saying like, um, do we actually have to say, okay, this is stressful. Then the stress comes. Like even if maybe you're really prepared for this test and you're very confident about it, you may still feel stressed. Um, you know, physically you may get those butterflies in your stomach and you may feel anxious, even though based on this model, you haven't really appraised it as stressful. So think about that as well. Okay. I think this is coming towards the end of this content block. Um, so in terms of coping with stress, as we talked about, this kind of ties in nicely with the model, like ways that you can cope with stress and how, um, one's ability to cope with this stress basically has the biggest influence on um how you feel about the situation hopefully that made sense so context specific effectiveness again think of the name the context specific it's effective so this is the idea that the coping strategy you have chosen it matches the stressor like you can almost think of that like lock and key kind of um so the example here is you have a test coming up the coping strategy that you've used um is study it kind of makes sense um, if you were to use something such as not thinking about the test, obviously that um, helps with the like present feeling of stress, but in the long run, it's not going to help eliminate the stressor because you're not kind of targeting that stressor. Um, and so it's this idea that, you know, you might have three different stresses and they might be very different. The coping strategy that works really well, so studying for this test, Maybe that doesn't help, you know, for another stressor, which might be, I don't know, you're having a fight with your friend. So that's the idea there um, in terms of context specific effectiveness. Coping flexibility. Think of it like neural plasticity. It's being this, it's this idea of being able to change and adapt. You're looking at the situation. Um, you realize, okay, this coping strategy I've employed, it's not that good. I'm going to change it. You're being flexible. Um, so the idea here is if you have, if you have a good, coping flexibility, like a high level of it. Generally, as a person, you'll be able to cope with stress a little bit better, which makes sense. Versus if you have this one coping strategy and you know like, okay, it's not really working, whatever, like it's worked for me in the past, I'm gonna stick to it and hopefully it works out. It's that idea of being inflexible. Um, and so that can lead to more stress because it's obviously not really helping with the situation. Okay, in terms of approach and avoidance, again, it's in the name approach. You're targeting the stressor directly. If you've got a test, you're studying for it. Avoidance, you're getting rid of the feelings of stress by ignoring um, or like evading the stressor essentially. So you're worried about the exam, you like watch a Netflix series because it takes your mind off it. Um, and it obviously helps the stress, but it's not directly tackling that stressor. And in the long run, um, the avoidance coping strategies aren't the best, like generally, because again, think about the exam. Um, approach ones usually target the stressor and can eliminate the feelings of stress that are caused by the stressor itself. Whereas avoidance is more so to do with um, making oneself kind of feel a little bit better sometimes. I'm going to skip the VCAR questions and do the slider polls because you have access to the slides. Um, but yeah, hopefully that made sense. I know we're going through this really fast. Um, Hopefully it's kind of sitting in a little bit. 
Okay, a weakness of Lazarus and Folkman's model. So hopefully this is fresh in your mind. You just talked about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How am I going for time? Okay. Okay, I'll probably cut it off in like two seconds because time is running a little bit short. Okay, lovely. Looks good. Um, yeah, so it's hard to test experimentally that idea of psychological processes like as in like internally like to do with the brain and things like that and like decisions and things there they tend to be hard because i think about it as we discussed before um it's hard to draw up an experiment and it's hard to measure like it's hard to put you know you assumedly like put people in the situation where you stimulate a stressor whatever um it's hard to get actual good accurate data that determines you know when is this person doing the primary appraisal and what is it and when are they deciding, you know, what coping resources they've got? It's just hard to test it experimentally. Um, this is a really good strength of it, accounting for the individual differences. The one on rats, that's gas. So the physiological response. So Salia's gas model. Um, and this is a weakness of gas as well, overemphasizing the physiological, so the body's response. If anything, you might say Lazarus and Folkman's overemphasize the psychological response. Okay, I think, yeah, that's the only one for now. I think we'll do questions. Yeah, okay, so before we go to our break, okay, we're running a little bit some time. I'll do like five minutes of question answering maybe. Um. Okay, so how much did you study and how much content did you cover on summer holidays? Good question, obviously, because you guys are in that position right now. Um, Not a lot. We got holiday homework. And it was on research methods, I want to say. Um, so obviously I did the holiday homework, but I didn't do anything ahead. Bear in mind, everything that I say with my tips here, I want you to know, understand that I did do psych in year 11. So during the year, and especially towards the end of the year, I had the ability to prioritize psych over my other one, two subjects. Um, so yeah, just bear that in mind. But at the start of the year, and this is actually the same for my year 12 subjects as well, I never went ahead and I didn't do, I don't think, I never, I didn't do any content summaries like before I got taught them by the teacher. And for me, this was just because of my learning style. Um, the way that I learned, I really needed to be like, to have it explained to me, like being talked through by my teacher for me to kind of get that good foundation. So then when I were to write my notes, I'd be like, yep, okay, I remember them talking about this, blah, 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 blah. And then I'd write my notes afterwards. Um, I think I might have tried this for Kim in year 12. I don't know, like it didn't work. Um, I like used the textbook and then did my summary notes before we had covered it in class. Um, and as I expected, it like just didn't sink in. I don't know, my brain just is, doesn't have the aptitude for that. Again, everybody's learning styles are different, so it may work for you. Um, but I personally didn't like going ahead because for me, it ended up being a waste of time because it never stuck in properly. And then I would need the teacher to teach it to me to understand it and then go back and like read notes that I had done before. And it, it was just disjointed. So for me, um, basically with the stuff of psych, I just did what the holiday homework was. Um, I think again, I had time to go over psych when I needed to a little bit later in the year. So I would recommend read the study design and understand what's coming um that's a good thing because i know like when we would go into like let's say stress or letting in memory like i didn't i wasn't even aware of what's on study design especially when we went to like sleep and stuff towards unit four like at the end of unit three like i didn't even know what we would be studying the next week um because i just like didn't i didn't use the study design as much as i should have until the end of the year which was again the biggest thing that i did in year 12 Kind of learning from that mistake in psych 3 4. Um, so yeah, essentially, I would, if I was you, I would just get a really good awareness of the study design, especially again because your study design is new. So at least read through it um, and have a general idea. Again, like don't, um, you don't have to like go and like know everything, but um, yeah, I would say like the minimum or like what I would 
suggest to do essentially is yeah read the study design and have an awareness of what you're going to cover in the year just so you're not like thrown in the deep end a little bit when your teacher is starting to introduce new concepts and you don't even have any idea what's going on um but yeah summer holidays i'm trying to think of like year 12 i don't think i did like i just did the holiday homework again um which obviously turned out to be like stuff on area of study one so i'd say if anything if you do want to cover something like in depth like just do area of study one um which is what we've just been through it's like nervous system and stress um so yeah maybe like if you really are dying to do something then just nervous system stuff you may again depends on the learning like i know for me writing the notes didn't help but if you want to you can write notes or even just like watch some videos on it so you can get a bit of an understanding maybe if what we've been through just then nervous system and stress if there was any bit of it that way you were like what is she talking about i don't understand what's going on at all maybe watch a video on that or write some brief notes on that so you can kind of get a bit of a baseline understanding so then when your teacher teaches it to you you pick it up really well um hopefully that makes sense i hope that has answered the question but yeah the answer is generally not a lot just because for my learning style it didn't really help to go ahead too much um and you don't need to honestly you don't need to and i know like again it just depends on learning style because some people might do it like for confidence as well or obviously just to know the content to get ahead one thing is you do not want to fall behind um i fell behind a little bit in year 12 i didn't in psych 3 4 because it was my only subject um year 12 subject but try your best to not fall behind if you have a tendency to fall behind then maybe going ahead might be what you need to do um but yeah essentially in the summer holidays like you don't really have to do a lot I would say if anything just do area of study one like you don't need to have like unit three and unit four drill into your brain before you go in to your first class okay hopefully that makes sense okay i'll do like one more question because i know we should have a break um study techniques okay brilliant question um in when i did psych three four i relied my main thing was my notes so my chapter summaries um i would say it was similar in year 12 but I would suggest do more practice questions. I think for me, because I was, again, in year 11, that had a bit of a role. Like I had lots of time to really let, like when I was writing my notes, like everything like synced in. Um, A way to kind of accelerate that process, in my opinion, and again, what I picked up in year 12 is do your practice questions. So I'd say this, the two main things that I would suggest and that did essentially work for me um, is chapter summaries for actually learning and understanding the content and then um practice questions just for letting everything sink in and obviously it's good because your sacks and your exams are those practice questions so that's what you're going to be assessed on it's not enough to just do the chapter summaries and never do a practice question and then go in like obviously like you know the content but especially for confidence and especially um because the exam is set by VCAR, um, it's just so helpful to have some exposure to VCAR questions. Um, and your teachers will base their questions off VCAR as well. So those are the two things I would recommend. Um, again, it's a lot of content. So flashcards, if they work for you, I personally hated them, so I didn't use them, but they are a very good tool. Um, mind maps, as I mentioned, especially when you finish an area of study or you finish a unit, mind maps are so helpful for me. Um, the way I learned things was like when I would kind of take a step back and do the bigger picture stuff that helped me a lot and it's very hard to do it in January especially when you haven't learned it but I found myself I would do this like especially in like June or going into like term three as well um like understand things a little bit wider than just like zooming in and definition so understanding like we're going to learning in memory um like, you know, what is the definition of, you know, classical conditioning and what is this stimulus and this stimulus? Like, take a step back and think, okay, um, how does the stuff from the neurons work, you know, and how does that tie into learning and how does that work with the brain structures and how does that tie into classical conditioning? Stuff like that. For me, that helped because I was basically memorizing different areas of study in one story, I want to say. Like, it's not a story, but like I made this kind of again you can kind of think of it as like a flow chart sort of like flowing from one concept to another and then so in my head they were all tied in in this one bubble and so when you study like you can kind of compartmentalize like that that sort of helped um 
diagrams really helped as well. I would put them all over my notes. Um, but yeah, revisit. Oh, one thing I would definitely suggest is revise your notes. Like whatever your main thing of learning is, um, revise them. For me, again, because it was my first three, four, I wasn't really familiar with this idea, you know, of having your one exam at the end of the year. So in, I would say like August, I hadn't touched this stuff. So like nervous system and stress, I hadn't touched it since we did it in like February and March. And it took me ages. Like I had to go back and basically relearn everything because I forgot. Um, and again, I was in year 12. So I had, I mean, year 11. So I had the time to do that. Especially if you're in year 12, do not forget your era study one stuff. Revisit it constantly because it'll save you so much time, you know, in October, in September when you're revising. Um, so just try to keep everything fresh in your mind for the whole year. It's like a stitch in time saves nine or whatever. Like if you just put in a little bit, you know, like revise air study a little bit, um, you know, in May, in June, in July, by the time you get to your exam study, you're not having to like legitimately reach, relearn the concepts and that will save you a lot of time. So I'd suggest that as well. Okay. I've been talking too long. Hopefully that answered the question as well. If you've got any specific questions as to what I've just said, add them in. Hopefully we'll get through them. Okay, so getting into a little bit more, learning in memory is very content heavy. I'm just going to preface that. Like you can see, this is literally one dot point. Um, okay, so it's like 2.40 now. What I might do, because I know we have a couple questions, I think I will do about half an hour of this. So then at 3.10, so 20 minutes before we finish, I'll jump onto the Q&A. So I'll do that. Um, so try to get through everything in half an hour. If I don't get to everything, if there's a bit of memory that we miss out on, again, you'll get the slides and please feel free to email me if you have any questions about memory, if you don't cover it. But again, I just think it might be better to miss some stuff on memory. And then you look at that in the slides in your own time, as opposed to missing a lot of questions that you guys might be asking. Okay. So classical conditioning, basically our first model of learning. So what this says here um, is you're looking at classical conditioning and you are looking at involuntary association. This is a big thing. Involuntary, um, you've got your three phases and then you have operant conditioning. So this is what's covered in the stop point. Like really, they can have, they could have separated it. It's not that big. Um, it's just your classical conditioning, involuntary, your operant conditioning with your stuff like reinforcement and punishment. We'll get to it. All the words will make sense. Um, so classical conditioning where... Conditioning basically just means learning. So we are associating different stimuli together. We're creating this unconscious pairing inside our head. So the best way to learn this is kind of through example. Um, and so the main thing we look at is Pavlov. I'm sure you guys might've heard of him before, like Pavlov's dogs. He basically um, discovered this or like, you know, did the first experiment, whatever it is. Um, by making these dogs salivate to the sound of a bell. So here are just some terms. Again, it seems like a lot, you will get it. So stimulus, a thing, something that will cause a response. So an action, that's the basic part of it. Unconditioned, it's natural. You haven't learned it. Conditioned, it's been learned. Through this process, you've created this learned association. Neutral is neutral. So to break that down a little bit, Unconditioned stimulus, um, the thing that causes a response naturally. And so the unconditioned response is that said response. So in this case, you can refer to the diagram on the right. Your unconditioned stimulus is food and the unconditioned response is salivation. Naturally, without learning it instinctively, the dog will see the food and salivate. It's a natural process, unconditioned. The neutral stimulus is the bell. When you ring a bell in front of the dog, it does nothing, neutral. With this step of classical conditioning, I think we will describe it. Yeah, we'll describe it there. But um, basically during conditioning, so during like the main bit of this, you pair the food and the bell. So you present the food and the bell, so the bell ringing, to the dog multiple times, pairing, repeated pairing. And so in the dog's head, it's seeing, okay, food, yum, salivation. But in the background, it's always hearing this ringing. So now it's starting to associate the food with the bell ringing. Therefore, this response is coming in response to the bell as well as the food. So after this constant, constant pairing, so just think like in the dog's mind, the bell and the food are becoming one. 
we are getting this association between the food and the bowel. So this dog learns this, that ultimately after, because the dog is so used to this bell being present when it salivates, that after conditioning, so after this process of learning, the dog will salivate when the bell is wrong. So there's no food in sight anywhere, but you know, Pavlov rang the bell and then the dog salivated in response. So it's this idea of classical conditioning. The dog initially had no response to this bell and then through pairing it with something that caused salivation, the dog has now learned to associate salivation with the sound of the bell ringing. So hopefully that makes sense, I think. Yeah, you can kind of pick that up in here. The main thing to be aware of is you can see that the term changes. So this is the neutral stimulus when it elicits no response. After learning, it's eliciting a conditioned response. So you've learned, this response has been learnt. So then this now becomes the conditioned stimulus. The actual thing itself, it's still the bell. The neutral stimulus is the bell. The conditioned stimulus is the bell. It's just when it's neutral, it elicits, like the dog doesn't do anything. Now as the conditioned stimulus, it produces that conditioned response. So re be really mindful of that. And it's very important when you are writing to make it clear if you're referring to the bell as a neutral stimulus, if you're referring to the bell as the conditioned stimulus. And this idea that one causes no response and one causes the response. As well, on that note, the conditioned response is the exact same thing as the unconditioned response. It's salivation. What differs is what it's in response to. Unconditioned is in response to the food. Conditioned is in response to the bell. When you're writing out a short answer, spell that out clearly. If you just say salivation and it's ambiguous as to what it's in response to, you won't get the mark. So salivation in response to the food. Salivation in response to the bell. You have to spell it out. Um, okay, so here is the process a little bit more. So you can see it's three phases. Before conditioning, during conditioning, after conditioning. Um, memorize this. And you can add in um, the bell producing no response. So NS arrow nothing really um, to this before stage. Memorize this and you'll use this as a formula when you write your short answers. I used to... Um, like always think about this when I would write my short answers. And I always suggest to my students, like literally you can write it down like next to where you're going to be writing your short answer. Like you can literally just write like UCS, arrow, UCR, NS, nothing, you know, UCS plus NS, arrow, UCR. Um, just so you have that there because you might get like four mark questions asking to, you know, explain how this response of classical conditioning is occurring blah, blah, blah. And so it's a lot of writing, right? And it's easy to kind of get off track if you're not thinking like on this path the whole time. Therefore, having this little thing kind of next to you may help guide you a little bit. In general, you can see before conditioning, it's everything is instinctive. Everything is automatic. So food and salivation. Again, we're pairing it. So you're ringing the bell, presenting the food. You're ringing the bell, presenting the food, ringing the bell, presenting the food. After that, um, so bear in mind during conditioning, it's this repeated trials. It's not just once, it's multiple times. Um, so then after this kind of relationship is so strong, this association is so strong that the dog will salivate in response to the bell. Okay, that's the general gist of it. With operant conditioning, um, again, another type of learning, but the um, it's more voluntary and the learner is more active compared to classical conditioning where it's like unconscious involuntary um with classical conditioning like you can see sometimes it's used in advertising so like the association between you know the certain product and like an emotion or happiness fun whatever it'll be unconscious right with operant conditioning it's behavior it's action it's very active it's voluntary um so the kind of principle behind this is that idea that if you are rewarded for doing something, you will do it again. If you are punished for doing something, you're not going to do it again, basically. So consequences determine the actions and determine the likelihood of you repeating a certain behavior. Um, okay, so the three things to be aware of, your ABC. So your antecedent is basically just the stimulus, like really just exchange it with the word stimulus to make it easier. I don't like antecedent. I don't even know like what the word actually means, but just think of stimulus. Um, behavior, behavior, consequence, whether it's basically being reinforced, um, or punished. 
essentially. So the antecedent is basically the stimulus that will trigger this certain behavior to happen. And the consequence is obviously what happens to the learner in response to doing this behavior. Okay, so in terms of kind of our consequences and how this, I guess, leads to a process of learning, you have your reinforcement. Again, think of the word. So reinforcement, this is going to increase the likelihood of that behavior happening again. Reinforced, where think of like strengthening. Um, if I, you know, get a pat on the head for picking up the rubbish at school, um, my behavior is being reinforced. I'm going to get, you know, pat on the head again, so I'm going to do it again. It's that idea of reinforcement. So positive reinforcement, we have positive and negative reinforcement. On the flip side, we have positive and negative punishment. If there's one thing you remember regarding operant conditioning, please know positive and negative does not mean good and bad in this situation. It means giving something or taking away. So think of it from a very mathsy perspective, not like positive is a good reward, negative is a bad reward. Positive you are being given something in response for doing this behavior. Negative, you are getting something taken away from you um, for doing this behavior. So think about this. Think about what I've just said. And then remember that we're talking about reinforcement. So think to yourselves and understand. Again, it's important with this stuff that you have this understanding. Don't rote learn what does positive reinforcement mean? What does negative reinforcement mean? Think about it logically in your head until you understand it. So positive reinforcement, I am going to give the learner something that makes them more likely to repeat this behavior. Hopefully you guys are thinking you're going to give them something good. If someone is going to give me something that is going to make me more likely to do something, it better be good, right? So they're going to give the dog a treat for sitting. Um, you're going to give a child money. You're going to give them chocolate. You're you know, going to give them an award. This idea that you are giving something that you'd obviously you know, enjoy. So it makes you more likely to repeat this behavior again because you want to be rewarded again. I hope that makes sense. On the other hand, negative reinforcement. I'm going to take something away so that the learner is more likely to do this behavior. You're going to take away something bad. Um, so the umbrella one is kind of a bit random, but like, um, yeah, taking away Panadol or maybe like, if you like sometimes when you're in class and then the teacher will be like, oh, you can leave five minutes early if you do this or whatever. Um, that idea of you're taking away something bad. So in this context, the bad thing would be five minutes of extra class. Um, so again, taking something that the learner doesn't like away. So therefore they're going to be more likely to do this behavior because they're going to want that negative stimulus or negative thing to be taken away more. So I hope that is making sense. Again, reinforcement, strengthening your behavior. Punishment is the flip side. So when you're trying to discourage a behavior, again, it makes sense in terms of what punishment means. So negative punishment um, and positive punishment. So pun positive punishment, it's the same principle. You are making someone less likely to do something by giving them something. So you're going to give them something bad. Um, so yeah, doing more chores, running extra laps. So the person is going to be discouraged from coming late to training because they don't want to run extra laps in the future because they don't like it. Negative punishment, you're taking away something good. So you're being grounded. Um, you're losing your phone. You're taking away money, like getting a fine maybe. Um, that idea of removing something good or that the person values or that the person likes so that they're less likely to do that behavior in the future. So if you get fined, a billion dollars or if you lose your license for speeding then you are going to be less likely to speed in the future um this is a bit of an aside response cost is basically the exact same thing as negative punishment in the previous study design the word response cost was written on there um as you can see it's not written oh sorry i didn't realize how far away it was um it's not written on there anymore it just says reinforcement positive and negative punishment positive and negative so I would not expect the term response cost to come up in anything from Vika, but just be aware of that. And if you see anything in past resources with the word response cost, it's just negative punishment. Okay, so again, this is just a bit of a summary that you can look at. Um, some differences. So again, voluntary and operant conditioning because it's that action. You're very active. You learn quite actively because you're involved directly. Classical conditioning is very like 
subconscious. You're not really thinking about it. The dog isn't willingly saying, oh, okay, I'm going to learn to salivate to this bell. Like it's unconscious. Um, okay, so kind of our little third one. Understand that this is a little bit separate, so it's not conditioning, um, but it's learning by observation. So it is this step-by-step -step process um, of these five stages here. So observational learning, as it sounds, you are basically, it almost ties in pretty well with operant conditioning, I would say. Um, but you're almost watching someone else be operantly conditioned and then that determines your behavior so you're learning by observation um so you have this idea of vicarious conditioning reinforcement punishment vicarious just means um but basically like through someone else so when you live an experience with someone else like through someone else so like um yeah if someone like posts their holiday online like maybe be like oh i'm living through you vicariously like you're not actually in europe but you feel like you're in europe because you're looking at their photos vicarious um so when you see terms like this it just means you are being reinforced through the actions of someone else so someone else is being rewarded for a behavior you are vicariously being reinforced when you watch them because you think oh i want a chocolate or i want an award um so i'm going to do what that person did so you're learning to kind of do that behavior as well um so it's very much focused around this idea of a model and there's a very big emphasis on kind of selecting a model as well so obviously children um when you think about observational learning often the scenarios that you'll get in your sex and in your exams are with children because children basically learn a lot from the people around them from their models right so obviously like their parents or their guardians um you know celebrities sports people that they idolize stuff like that um so these steps are attention retention reproduction motivation and reinforcement um remember it through an acronym but also understand it again a very good example do not wrote learn do not think okay attention this retention this think what is attention what does it mean why would it be step one why is it necessary in observational learning i can't emphasize it enough it takes a while for like to learn to do this kind of stuff and obviously to think of something a little bit deeper but once you understand it it makes answering questions so much easier and it makes retaining the information so much easier as well so i really highly recommend it. like the more effort you put in to learn something very deeply the better you'll be in the long run um okay so in saying that the first three steps attention basically you're selecting your model um so you are paying attention to the model so for example um Say it is like a parent maybe like kicking a soccer ball or something like that. I don't know, doing a soccer trick, whatever, Um, a football. Um, So you are paying attention. Perhaps there is reasons to why you'll pay attention to this person. If it is your parent, obviously you will idolize them to some degree and you want to be like them. Perhaps it's an older sibling. It's a celebrity. You're not going to pay attention to someone who you don't care about, to someone who you don't like, and you're not going to reproduce their behavior. Um. So that's why you can see that as well here, where you see similarities, where you see popularity, where you see achievement, you're going to follow them. Um, okay, so that's just attention. That's just looking at them. Retention. What does retention mean? Retaining. Think memory. So the individual, the learner, is actually able to kind of memorize this picture of what's going on. So seeing their parent, um, you know, do this little football trick or seeing their parent follow this recipe and cook this meal um retention so actually memorizing and having this visual image reproduction having the physical capability and the mental capability as well to repeat the action so if you are um looking at i don't know like a sumo wrestler or something or if the football trick is really tricky and crazy and the learner is a three-year-old they're not going to have the physical capability to like actually move their legs in a complex way so they won't be able to learn the behavior because they cannot physically reproduce it. So that is what it means by reproduction. And same with mentally as well. So if um, you put a six-year-old in a year 12 class trying to learn, you know, a maths problem, they're not going to be able to reproduce it unless they're like a super genius. Okay, so motivation and reinforcement. These are often tied in very closely. Some people treat them as one um, actual stage and sometimes they are even interchanged. Um, 
But we have motivation and reinforcement. So motivation, again, you actually want to do this behavior. So, you know, you idolize your parent, you, um, you know, can physically do it. You remember everything they're doing, but if they're cooking this disgusting meal, you're not going to be motivated to do it. If they're um, doing this sports trick for a sports that you have, a sport that you hate, you're not going to want to do it. So you actually have to be motivated and reinforcement, obviously. So tying into our previous stuff from before, um, you're not going to replicate a behavior if you don't see someone rewarded for it. If you don't, if you see someone punished for it, on the other hand, um, yeah, you'll be reinforced essentially. So if you want to see, if you want to be reinforced, um, which everyone really does, then they'll copy the behavior. If you see that the individual, um, I'm trying to think of an example. I don't know, like the, you, again, like your classmate getting an award versus if your classmate is getting punished, you can have all of the four steps ticked. Like you even want to do the behavior. Ooh, but if you see them being punished by their teacher, you're less likely to do it. Again, it ties in very closely to operant conditioning. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, you can see modeling from, especially with children. Um, again, take some time to do the VCAR stuff yourself. So this is new. Um, so we're looking here again, understand the dot points as well. So the general thing we're looking at are approaches to learning that situate the learner within a system. So think about what that means. So you are learning something and you're basically in the environment versus learning something, you know, by theory or learning something in a classroom that you're meant to apply to the real world versus like actually learning it in the situation. That's what that means. And the example that you have to know is as illustrated by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of knowing where learning is viewed as being embedded in relationships where the learner is part of a multimodal system. So again, this idea of learning within a system of knowledge patterned on country. So it's this idea of learning um, in the context, perhaps of these, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and situations as well. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, in terms of the actual stuff, so situated learning theory is something that you might look at. And it's this idea of learning being more effective when you are learning it in the place where it, where you're actually going to apply that action. So for example, um, it's like me, like this, you know, I'm going to go into a hospital placement very soon. My past two years have been all at uni, like learning theory, right? So that's the idea of the learning that I, the stuff that I learned this year will probably be more effective because rather than learning stuff relating to my course, you know, in my computer, in the lecture theater, I'm going to be learning it in my like future place of work. So that idea that the learning can be more effective and you'll see that with, you know, placements across all types of degrees as well, um, or all types of vocations or types of learning, that idea of, um, you know, placement kind of part of your course being in the environment that you're going to work in rather than everything being theory, everything being learned behind a classroom and then being thrown into your, your environment when you haven't been there before. So that's that idea or like an example of that. Um, so you can see here situated cognition. So you've got um, communal and collaborative knowledge. So again, this kind of sharing of ideas. So other members of the system, people that are you know in the workplace or you can see in the same community, you know, such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, community. So you've got people in the same community, in the same situation, you know, kind of perhaps doing the behavior that you're learning as well. That idea of communication and collaboration, you've got less rigid learning. So when, again, you think about like classrooms and stuff like that can very, can be very structured and rigid, structured and rigid, sorry, versus once you're in the environment can be a little bit looser, I guess. Um, and again, mastering context specific skills. We know what context specific means as opposed to rote learning information. So it's just like, it's, it makes sense if you think about um, situating the learner within the system. So hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, so in terms of these kind of ways of knowing as referred to on the study design, we can see it's learning based on traditions and cultures that have been taught, you know, from ancestors and coming down through generations and then being taught, you know, to other members of the community, basically. Um, so we can see that there's heaps of different kind of facets of this. Um, but as was referred to here, this idea of knowledge patterned on country. So it's a very tight relationship with the environment itself. Um, so we can see land and country and some of the examples, as I shared here, we've got the community link. So again, engaging with the people in the community who are teaching you the things as well. Um, this idea of symbolism, we've got, again, 
the land itself. And that's kind of where the emphasis of country comes in um, because it's this idea of being situated within the system. So where the skills are going to be applied, that's where you're learning. Um, so then we've got all the kind of stuff that's outlined in this image here. And you can see how they all connect with one another as well. So it's that idea of this deep rooted knowledge and all of this wise like information that's being learnt in the environment where it's being taught. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, Slido poll, I assume. Yep, and then we'll go on to memory. I think time is okay. Um, okay, ranking. So what is the correct order of steps in observational learning? Um, okay, we have like five-ish more minutes to get through some stuff. Um, yeah, so you just kind of slide it around. So see if you can remember this. I know it's five steps, so it's a lot, and the words don't really lend themselves to much of an order. Mm -hmm. Looking good so far. Yeah, okay, great. Sorry to cut anyone. Oh, actually, I'll just keep going. Um. So yeah, attention, retention, reproduction, motivation, reinforcement. Um, an acronym for this is like uh, Mister. That's one that I learned. Um, that helped me. Um, but yeah, essentially, as long as you also memorize the steps and why they are key in observational learning, that's the main thing you need to do. But yeah, good job. Okay, our next poll. So the neutral stimulus is the same as the what? Remembering our thing on Pavlov's dogs. What is the neutral stimulus? And, what, and when I say the same, I mean like the same thing. Obviously not the same concept or terminology. So the neutral stimulus is the same as what? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, again, sorry to cut anyone off who's voting, but just for the sake of time, um, yeah, so we've got condition stimulus. So the neutral stimulus is the same as the condition stimulus. Um, remember this because remember a stimulus is like the thing and then a response is the action. So the stimulus can't really be like a thing and an action. So it would either be conditioned or unconditioned stimulus. And it is the condition stimulus because remember the neutral stimulus is the bell. It's the something that it's the thing that causes no response initially. And then through the process of conditioning, the learner learns to elicit a response to it. So that's why it becomes the conditioned stimulus. The unconditioned stimulus is the food. So the unconditioned stimulus always stays as the unconditioned stimulus. Um, it's the conditioned stimulus and the neutral stimulus that change. And then the response. So the unconditioned response and the conditioned response are the same thing but one is to the unconditioned stimulus and one is to the conditioned stimulus again i know the terms are very confusing once you get a little bit more confident with it you'll get it um okay we will use like the next 30 seconds we'll use maybe we'll do a bit like five minutes on memory um and then we'll do questions okay so um this is probably the most important thing with memory, the atkinson Schifrin model. So it's this idea of your sensory, your short-term and your long-term memory. So it is just a model and this is it. Again, I know it looks complex. It will take a while for it to be understood, but understand we have basically it moves from left to right. So your sensory memory, if you pay attention to your sensory memory, it goes to your short-term memory. If you work really hard to integrate that into your brain, it becomes long-term memory. And then we've got our different types of long-term memory as well. Bear in mind, sensory memory is instant. Um, so your iconic, an icon, photo, visual. So visual sensory stuff, echoic, echo, sound, like the sound that you're hearing basically. Um, very, very brief. So if you were to remember everything in short-term memory or long-term memory that is iconic, that's like basically a photographic memory. So it's very brief. So it's like what I'm looking at my laptop, what I'm looking at on my laptop right now, 
um, it's iconic memory. Like it's coming through my eyes and I've got a memory of it. If I walk outside of this room and do something else, I'm not going to remember exactly like everything in this room that I'm looking at because the brain knows that that would be irrelevant. It's not necessary for that to be put into long-term memory. So we'll talk about that a little bit more so we can see here exactly how short it is. 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 seconds is iconic. Echoic is a little bit longer. The way that I remembered this is my teacher used to explain um, iconic. Think of it as a movie. Like, you know how a movie is basically just stills played really fast. Um, or like when you have those little flip books, when you have a different drawing and then you flip it and it looks like a cartoon. Think about it like that. Your, like your iconic memory is so short. It allows um, every like photo that comes in every 0 0.2 seconds to play really fastly so that when you move your head or when you look around, the world appears seamless. So that's how I used to remember it. Echoic memory is still really short. It wouldn't help if you can remember, you know, everything that a person said one minute ago. Um, so it's about three to four seconds. This is longer than echoic though. I'm sorry, iconic. You can think three to four seconds is about enough just to retain what the person's hopefully said in a sentence. So this idea of um, sometimes when someone is telling you something and you're a little bit distracted and you might be like, huh, like, what did you say? And then before they've said it again, you'll say, oh, wait, no, I know what you said. Um, because your echoic memory can be about like four seconds long. It wouldn't help if it was 0 0.2 seconds because you would remember one word that a person says. If I were to say the Atkinson Chiffron model represents, you would remember the, maybe Atkinson. So it wouldn't be very conducive to existing, really. Um, so understand that. Um, again, very, very brief. We don't often pay attention to it. Like most of the noise in the background, the brain just filters it out. You don't pay constant attention to it because otherwise you would just be, your brain would explode. It would be way too overstimulated. And so that's really important of sensory memory to be really brief. Okay. Short term memory, you're paying, you're paying attention to something. It's going into your working memory. So this is something that you're actually focusing on consciously. Um, so again, very brief, about 12 to 18 seconds. You can say like 12 to 30. Um, also very limited capacity. So it's very brief. You can't fit a lot in. And that's why you can only focus on so many things at once and why you can forget things really quickly if you're not focusing on them a lot. Um, you have to remember these numbers. So the duration about 12 to 18, say 30 seconds. And the item, so seven plus or minus two. So five to nine items. Um, if you are being told more than nine items, so if you're getting a list of words or a list of numbers and they give you 20, you won't be able to remember all of them because your short-term memory isn't big enough, basically. Um, okay, long-term memory, as it sounds, just everything that's really in your forever brain. Very tricky to test, obviously. So potentially unlimited, potentially um, forever lasting, essentially. Okay, so you have your explicit memory. So if you remember the diagram before, explicit, think about the words. Explicit means you have to recall it consciously. So when you recall this memory, you are consciously thinking of it and retrieving this memory. So you have your episodic and your semantic. Episodic, think of an episode of your life. Um, it's like details of events that you've lived through. Semantic, think semantics. It's just like knowledge, information. Um, so it's just general type of stuff. So knowing where Australia is on a map, knowing, you know, that seven times 10 equals 70, stuff like that. Um, that's your semantic memory. So you can see that those are different, but both of them are explicit because you don't subconsciously retrieve information that seven times 10 equals 70, if that makes sense. Um, you have to consciously think of it to say it, to speak it out. So that's why it's explicit. If we compare that to implicit, you don't think, oh, sorry, you don't think about memorizing it when you retrieve the information. So procedural, how to do something, how to brush your teeth, how to ride a bike. Every time you do these things, you're not consciously thinking of it um, in order to be able to do it. Classically conditioned memory, it's very niche and specific. It's basically, again, this idea of um, if you think of salivation to the bell, memory of that association, it's unconscious. You don't retrieve it with awareness. Um, okay, so 
Again, I know it's a lot, but this is basically everything you have to know about the multi-store model of memory. So unlimited capacity, anything can come into your sensory memory. I can hear as many sounds as I want to. Um, think about like if you're at a festival or a theme park, you know, all these bright colors, all these loud noises, um, everything's being bombarded at you. Um, but everything is very brief in terms of the duration and only things that we pay attention to will come into our direct consciousness. Bear in mind, this is a very finite little space. You have five to nine items. It's about 30 seconds long um, before that stuff leaves your short-term memory. If you don't basically shove it into long-term memory or keep it in your short-term memory for longer, um, it gets displaced. You forget about it. So that's why, you know, if someone was to read you like 15 numbers, it doesn't fit, so you will forget them. Um, whereas if you pop it into long-term memory, again, basically unlimited, basically lasts forever, you have your implicit and your explicit, and it's just stored in your memory forever, supposedly. Um, okay. I think there are a couple of slides left. I might just go... So brain structures, basically what to know, hippocampus, very important, the most important to know. Um... This is really important with your explicit long-term memories. Just remember that explicit long-term memories, it's very important at moving them from short-term to long-term memory. So very important. If you damage that, think of everything I've said, episodic memories, events of your life, semantic memories, you know, general knowledge information. If the hippocampus is affected, that information cannot be put from short-term into long-term. Um, amygdala, we're thinking about emotional memories. Essentially, think of stuff with fear. Um, that's very important. So amygdala kind of associated with that. Um, cerebellum, it's just, it's, it's at the back of your head. Um, think about like lots of procedural memories and stuff like that. Um, basal ganglia, other implicit memories. Sorry to be cycling through this so quickly. If we have less questions, then I might come back to it. Um, basically this idea of episodic and semantic memory. So our explicit memories that we've just talked about, um, how they're important in basically retrieving autobiographical events, because think episodic is the actual, like you're living through those events. And then semantic is the general knowledge stuff. So kind of where were you, um, you know, what were you doing? The facts of an autobiographical event, um, those tie in together to help you retrieve. So when you're thinking of my fifth birthday party, Okay, maybe something more recent, like, I don't know, your 15th birthday party, you might think about, um, oh, I was really excited. Oh, I remember thinking I want to look really good. Oh, I remember smelling um, the candles on the cake, whatever. That idea of that episodic aspect of it. Um, and then semantic is just the, like, um, you know, my house is a bit like this, blah, blah, blah. That other stuff. Um, regions of the brain. So basically, when you imagine, when you think about the future, you rely on your memory. Um, think about, you know, like when you envision your future, like what aspects of it, there's stuff that's familiar to you. It's stuff that is in your memory that constructs the future, if that kind of makes sense. Um, again, think about your episodic and your semantic things as well. Alzheimer's disease, this is pretty important. Um, basically, it's neurodegeneration. We're seeing it um, majorly in the hippocampus. So we get memory loss essentially these two things highlighted in pink are important for you to know it's like certain structures that you see within the brain of someone with alzheimer's the main reason you learn about it again think about the context um alzheimer's disease it's affecting the memory predominantly so we're thinking of neurons basically dying again see how this ties in with stuff we've talked about with the nervous system and then again when you look at the hippocampus in more detail it'll make more sense as well um, aphantasia, basically you don't visualize imagery. Um, so when you recall kind of events, you don't see them. Like for example, when I was recalling the 15th, um, birthday party, you don't see the 15th birthday party, but you list the facts about the 15th birthday party. Um, so it's that idea of not being able to visualize imagery when you recall memories and you think about things, um, yeah. Okay. In terms of mnemonics, they're basically just like, again, you would be familiar with acronyms, acrostics, this sort of stuff. I'm going to skip over it. Um, but you want to learn it in this context of ATSI communities. 
Um, so this idea of mnemonic, like we talked about with same, right? Okay, it's here. Um, these are important when you're thinking about written cultures. So acrostics, stuff like that, that can help remember things. Um, with cultures that are less so focused on written, but rather verbal, or, you know, oral cultures, um, you can use things such as song lines or song narratives, sorry, sung narratives, where basically it's less, you know, using written memory aids, um, but using our words. So you can think here, song lines. So basically that is due with describing a journey. So you can see landmarks, characteristics, and it's within a song. So think about um, what I said in terms of short-term memory and stuff like that. When you learn a song, when you learn something that is sung, you know a lot, right? Because you remember it in chunks. You remember it one flowing from the other. So it's like a little bit of a hack, I guess, to remember something. Compare that to poetry. If you were to have the lyrics of a song, not to a jingle, it's a lot harder to memorize. Um, so this idea of being able to chunk information, but add in, you know, tempo, melody, stuff like that, that helps retain information. And then again, song lines are just a specific example of that.